Hello, and welcome to the webinar from Qualys on Unpacking CVEs in the FireEye Breach. My name is Tammy Casey, and today I'd like to welcome Anand Paturi, Travis Smith, and Aran Livana, who will be walking you through this webinar. If you have questions, please type them in the question box and we'll have a Q&A at the end of the session. Thank you so much for joining us. And now, Anand. Hello and uh, welcome to this webinar on uh, unpacking the CVEs in uh, FireEye Breach. Presented by myself, Anand Paturi, Aran Levene and uh, Travis Smith from uh, Qualys. In this webinar, we are going to go over uh, the CVEs related to the FireEye breach and uh, how organizations can protect themselves against these CVEs and also how organizations can um, um, detect any kind of a successful breach that has happened leveraging these CVEs within their uh, organizations. Uh, to start off with a little bit of uh, background, FireEye announced um, threat of their uh, Red Team tools on uh, December 8th uh, of uh, 2020 and um, uh, 16 CVEs were uh, known to be leveraged within these uh, red team tools. FireEye was basically using these red team tools um, to help uh, to conduct red team exercises in their uh, uh, target client environments and um, uh, these red team tools were uh, basically leveraging uh, 16 uh, CVEs. Um, now that adversaries have uh, access to these tools and um, um, the known behavior of these tools, um, the impact of um, uh, these tools against uh, legitimate organizations is uh, going to be huge because uh, they are in the hands of uh, adversaries at this point. So Qualys uh, went ahead and uh, decided to find out the footprint of these uh, 16 CVEs across, across its uh, customer base. And uh, what we found out was um, there were 7.5 million instances of uh, vulnerabilities across these uh, 16 CVEs. And among them, five of the CVEs were uh, more prevalent and also pose very high risk to organizations. So we decided to give a much more more uh, comprehensive threat exposure and uh, uh, best practices and also post-exploitation scenarios for these CVEs and uh, this webinar discusses all of those details. So the five CVEs that are uh, uh, the topic of discussion today are uh, uh, 2020 2019-0604, 2019-0708, 2017-11774 and 2016-0167. Uh, um, um, all, all of these uh, belong to the Microsoft ecosystem and we are going to look at them from uh, a threat exposure perspective, from identification and mitigation perspective and also from a post exploitation perspective. From a threat exposure perspective, we are primarily going to look at uh, what exploit tools are uh, known to be leveraging these um, CVEs, that is what exploit tools can be successfully used against each of these CVEs and which threat actors are primarily using those exploit tools um, against organizations to exploit these CVEs and uh, what are the set of attack vectors they are uh, implementing while uh, exploiting each of these CVEs and uh, how are they able to use those attack vectors to perform uh, say for example lateral movement or remote code execution or uh, other kinds of uh, activities on target networks and eventually what are they dropping into the target networks are they dropping malware uh, if yes what kind of malware are they just um, using that for lateral movement and uh, data exfiltration or are they dropping any kind of ransomware or are they um, just using it for uh, crypto mining etc those kinds of activities from an identification and mitigation perspective we are going to go over uh, the patch details available for each of the CVEs and how Qualys uh, can be leveraged to apply patches for um, uh, existing instances of these uh, CVEs within organizations and finally in terms of post exploitation we are going to look at um, the detection mechanisms um, of successful post-exploitation of these CVEs, especially in terms of um, uh, the IOCs that can be searched for uh, to um, find the impact uh, these CVEs um, or uh, the successful breaches um, 
that have leveraged the CVs have on your organization and uh, what kind of Yara signatures can be used to scan uh, for certain uh, artifacts of these uh, CVEs and uh, also what kind of observables can be searched within your organization um, using your endpoint detection products for any kind of um, uh, breach uh, uh, attempts or uh, successful breaches that have been conducted using these CVEs. So going over the first CVE, which is uh, 2021472, uh, which is which can be detected in your organization using uh, Qualys ID 91668 within the Qualys vulnerability scanner. This um, CVE is also dubbed as a zero logon. Um, essentially, what this is is this is a um, vulnerability within the uh, net logon uh, remote procedure connectivity protocol within uh, Microsoft systems. And uh, what happens is uh, the net logon um, a remote procedure connectivity uses a static uh, zero initiative vector when uh, initialization vector when it is in uh, AES mode, which allows the um, adversary uh, unauthenticated attacker to uh, pose as a, a system or to pose as a machine uh, that is part of the domain and uh, make a successful connection to the domain controller. And uh, eventually, since um, the vulnerability exists in the uh, Net logon protocol itself. This will allow the one uh, attacker to uh, gain master privileges over the domain controller. And uh, this is a very very high um, uh, critical vulnerability. And uh, um, as I mentioned, this gives master privileges against the domain controller itself. Um, this uh, poses heavy heavy um, risk in terms of um, uh, the impact it can cause to the target organizations. And uh, uh, the exploit or the, the POC exploit for this vulnerability is part of the Mimikatz tool, which is uh, a collection of scripts um, that can be executed against uh, Windows security components. And it is a legitimate tool available on uh, GitHub. And what we have seen is um, uh, threat actors have uh, quickly started to leverage this publicly available exploit from Mimikatz tool and then um, uh, started devising their own attack vectors on target organizations. Especially um, the threat actor group TA505 um, has started uh, using this uh, exploit tool Mimikatz to exploit target machines um, that have uh, the CVE and uh, they have uh, launched a campaign where uh, they are releasing fake updates um, that will connect the target infrastructure to their C2 servers. Another uh, notable um, advancement we have seen from threat actors is from uh, the Ryuk ransomware gang, where uh, they have also exploited this vulnerability in um, many machines using the same Mimikatz tool. However, they have once they have compromised the primary domain controller, they continued the lateral movement towards the secondary domain controller and then uh, moved on to the backup servers and planted the Ryuk ransomware and uh, started uh, uh, sending out the ransomware demand notices. Um, the time it has taken for anyone, uh, especially for Ryuk ransomware gang, uh, to compromise the primary domain controller using this vulnerability and to plant the ransomware is uh, astonishingly only seven minutes. So um, this vulnerability is a very, very critical vulnerability and uh, it is um, uh, the exploit uh, for this vulnerability is available within a publicly legitimately available exploit tool which makes it uh, much more easier for adversaries to uh, take advantage of um, uh, the vulnerability on target machines and uh, in terms of post-exploitation techniques, there um, are Yara rule signatures available um, that can be used or that can be used to scan your organization for any kind of um, uh, zero logon exploits that um, are existing within your um, uh, infrastructure uh, and also to find out any kinds of uh, Mimikatz um, exploit scripts that are uh, executing within your uh, environment. Uh, Microsoft released patches for this um, vulnerability immediately after it was disclosed and uh, uh, from Feb 9th of uh, 2021, Microsoft is introducing an enforcement mode which essentially rejects connections from any device that still hosts the uh, vulnerable uh, net logon protocol that we have discussed during the description of this vulnerability. Um, going to the next vulnerability which is um, 2019-0604. Uh, this is a vulnerability that exists within um, Microsoft uh, SharePoint Server. Um, essentially, what happens is uh, SharePoint Server does not uh, check the markup of uh, the source application package 
when uh, it is executing it it is a um, um, internally it's a deserialization uh, vulnerability within sharepoint um, application that allows the adversaries to perform an arbitrary code um, execution in the context of a sharepoint application pool and a sharepoint server farm eventually uh, them getting the root access to or the master access to the sharepoint uh, server on which they are executing this vulnerability uh, since this uh, exists at uh, the application layer um, this vulnerability has been heavily targeted uh, by planting web shells um, uh, primarily the threat group that we have noticed uh, targeting this vulnerability was uh, emissary panda threat group uh, immediately once this um, uh, vulnerability came out and uh, they were using the uh, china chopper web shell um, and uh, they were planting the china chopper web shell onto many government uh, outlook servers and uh, uh, sharepoint servers and uh, trying to exfiltrate the data or um, uh, do lateral movement from there the primary um, attack vector that they have used to perform lateral movement here also is uh, Mimikatz. So what um, uh, the observed behavior of these attackers, what it uh, suggests is uh, once they get hold of um, the SharePoint server after the arbitrary code execution, they apply the password spring attack scripts available within Mimikatz. Um, uh, tool and then they perform the lateral movement to the organization to make sure they are uh, making advancements to uh, make their presence felt across the network. So uh, this is uh, more of a vulnerability at the application layer rather than at the network layer, but it still has a devastating impact on the target organizations. Um, going back to um, going next to the uh, vulnerability, which is uh, 2019 0708. This is um, uh, dubbed as blue kit vulnerability, which exists within the uh, remote desktop protocol within um, uh, Microsoft. Uh, what this is, is um, uh, any user or unauthenticated adversary um, connecting to a target machine using the remote desktop protocol can send a, a specifically crafted request to actually perform remote code execution and then um, uh, do a privilege escalation and uh, gain access of the target machine. This, uh, in terms of execution and uh, uh, its impact, it is um, uh, very similar to uh, the SMB vulnerability that was exploited by the WannaCry ransomware um, attack a couple of years back. Uh, so this vulnerability gained a lot of attention uh, when it was first revealed. And uh, the POC exploit code as well was uh, available within the first 24 hours of the release. And um, uh, um, security researchers, when uh, they applied the POC code, uh, obviously it was successful and uh, the target machine was completely compromised. Uh, when honeypots were set up to see what kind of attack vectors or what kind of modus operandi uh, the adversaries would use, um, it was noticed that uh, most of the adversaries were able to uh, execute the publicly available POC exploit code and then gain access of the machine. However, um, they were using that um, to uh, perform crypto mining, uh, to uh, perform crypto mining uh, on the targeted machines rather than uh, going beyond and doing lateral movement. So this, uh, the most common observed behavior um, using the exploitation of this CVE was uh, crypto mining. However, um, this CVE um, exists on a vulnerable version of a remote desktop protocol. And uh, since most of the internet facing applications, they do use remote desktop protocol um, uh, as their uh, connectivity methodology. Um, it is highly recommended that um, uh, it be fixed as soon as possible. And on top of that, these machines can be easily found by running a, a recon scan uh, using tools like uh, Shodan. So this is more of a, um, a critical vulnerability that is uh, waiting to be exploited at a massive scale. And uh, we might see a, a more massive campaign like what happened with the uh, WannaCry um, ransomware attack in the future. The next vulnerability is uh, 2017 which is essentially a vulnerability that exists within um, uh, Outlook. Um, this is a very interesting vulnerability where um, um, the functionality of uh, Microsoft Outlook, it allows end user to customize the home page of um, the folder where uh, you can load uh, contents from a remote URL onto the home page upon, upon each um, uh, startup of that uh, folder, right? Each time you open the folder, you can um, get uh, you can fetch contents from a remote URL and um, uh, customize the look of that uh, folder. 
Um, what this uh, means is um, it is using the HTTP or HTTPS uh, protocol to gather contents from a remote location and execute that within the Outlook environment. And uh, this is done uh, by ieframe.dll, which is susceptible to remote code execution. And uh, since uh, it happens at startup um, of the uh, Outlook instance, the code is the remote executable code is uh, basically persistent, which means that it can uh, stay within the instance of Outlook for every startup. And uh, that's what makes it much more um, um, impactful in terms of risk, uh, in terms of high risk. And um, uh, SensePost was um, uh, able to reveal this vulnerability using a POC. And uh, they included the POC within their uh, tool called Ruler. And uh, again, as you can see, this is a publicly available exploit tool and uh, hacker groups, especially uh, APT33, which is a Iranian state sponsored um, hacker group has uh, started to exploit this and uh, they have used a legitimate uh, tool to exploit this vulnerability and uh, gain access of uh, Outlook instances. And from there on, they have um, uh, been able to apply multiple other vectors um, for um, uh, improving their uh, lateral movement and then gain access to the network itself. Uh, there are actually error rule sets that can be run against your network to or that can be run against your uh, Outlook to find the uh, persistent uh, shells uh, that are uh, executing from a remote location and then um, uh, see if um, it has been compromised as part of a post exploitation scenario or not. Finally, the last vulnerability that we are going to look at is uh, 2016-0167, which is um, uh, which is a vulnerability that exists within uh, Microsoft Graphical Component since um, it uh, mishandles the uh, object in the memory. Um, so this was um, a zero-day vulnerability when it was first released, um, and uh, it was uh, revealed um, within uh, Russian hacker forums. And uh, a threat actor named Buggy Corp, um, during our uh, threat research and during our uh, threat data gathering, what we found out was um, this uh, threat actor was um, um, selling uh, a workable exploit, uh, a POC exploit that actually works, which um, uh, exploit this vulnerability and uh, the uh, the rate uh, at which it was um, uh, quoted was uh, $90,000 and uh, it was being heavily um, uh, bargained as well in terms of uh, buying the exploit and targeting uh, machines that have this uh, CVE ID and uh, since this is uh, more of a local privilege escalation attack um, uh, the adversaries cannot actually send a special crafted request or uh, send a piece of code uh, through any kind of application layer and then execute it. Uh, they will have to uh, send their initial attack vector in terms of a spear phishing email or an attachment uh, to the target um, user and they have to open it and then only their uh, uh, exploit code would work uh, to gain access to the target machine. So a human intervention in terms of uh, phishing or a spear phishing attachment or executing or opening a fear phishing attachment uh, was a heavy prerequisite for this uh, vulnerability. This vulnerability uh, upon research was um, uh, heavily targeted um, within the uh, payments and the hospitality industry and um, um, especially to compromise their machines and uh, demand ransom. Um, so the observables that uh, adversaries left are um, um, malware and punch um, were defined by the threat actor themselves and they can be detected using uh, EDR products as well. Um, what we have seen across all these vulnerabilities is um, um, they are being targeted using known uh, uh, exploit tools, no, using known legitimate exploit tools. So um, adversaries essentially they um, are scanning the internet for machines with known vulnerabilities. And from then on, their initial um, uh, entry of attack vector is nothing but um, a known exploit or a POC or a known exploit tool. So until that point, uh, until that point, uh, the adversaries really uh, don't need any kind of a special skill uh, to actually find machines that have these known vulnerabilities because all of them use um, uh, known 
uh, outdated versions of uh, software or protocols so scanning for them is not that hard on top of that uh, there are uh, publicly available exploits uh, poc exploits and exploit tools as well that take advantage of these vulnerabilities so uh, in order to find machines that have these vulnerabilities and in order to gain the initial uh, step of attack vector or uh, to be successful in the initial step of attack vector of uh, uh, exploiting the vulnerability itself, uh, it's not that hard. Uh, from there on, adversaries, um, they get into their mode of uh, uh, implementing a complex attack vector in terms of password spraying or uh, in terms of um, uh, doing a lateral movement or in terms of compromising secondary domain controller um, likewise. And then they try to do uh, lateral movement and uh, data exfiltration. So um, one more important observation here is uh, all these vulnerabilities are a combination of um, uh, network layer and application layer. So um, there is no difference between um, the impact that uh, a network layer vulnerability would have on an organization than an application layer vulnerability would have in an organization. Uh, like how we have seen um, vulnerabilities um, that are uh, existing within the net logon protocol and vulnerabilities that exist within SharePoint, which is at the application layer, uh, they both allow attackers to perform uh, remote code execution and then uh, allow themselves to do a privilege escalation and then perform a lateral movement. So um, both network and application vulnerabilities uh, should be treated alike and uh, they should be treated um, um, equally impactful or uh, dreadful to target organizations. So that is uh, one of the common pattern that we are seeing that um, both application and network level vulnerabilities can uh, be leveraged by uh, adversaries to cause the same level of uh, impact. Um, having said that, uh, um, the good part here is all of these vulnerabilities do have patches and uh, uh, the vendors have been really, especially in this case, it, since it's only Microsoft, uh, they have been really proactive in terms of releasing the vulnerabilities, uh, sorry, uh, releasing the patches for these vulnerabilities and uh, letting the organizations know how to fix them and uh, uh, what are the best practices in order to uh, apply these patches. So from here, I'm going to give it up to um, Iran, who is going to go through our uh, Qualys patch management and show you how you can uh, efficiently uh, tackle these vulnerabilities by um, using the Qualys patch management system and applying patches efficiently. Thank you. So hi everybody, in this demo, I'm gonna show you how you can use the Qualys patch management model to remediate those SolarWinds FireEye uh, vulnerabilities. But I'm going to start from our VMDR prioritization tab, where you can actually see all missing vulnerabilities in your environment and prioritize them. We've added a new tab here, a new selection here, only for the solar gate vulnerability. So when I select it and I run this, click this prioritization now button, what will happen? I'll see all the vulnerabilities that are related to the solar gate, uh, um, uh, to solar gate and are relevant to my environment. As you can see here, this is the list of vulnerabilities. If I have my patch management license, I will also see a button near each one of those vulnerabilities. And this button indicates that I can actually patch those vulnerabilities using our patch model. If I don't have the patch model, I'll only be able to see uh, the correlation to patches, but I will not be able actually to apply those patches. But in this demo, I'm going to show you how you use pa the patch model to actually remediate those vulnerabilities. So here are my vulnerabilities that are related to SolarWind, and I'm going to do, I'm going to select uh, the, the vulnerabilities that I can actually patch, okay? And, oh, sorry, I am selected those guys. And this is the list. And let's say that I want to take all those vulnerabilities and basically remediate all those vulnerabilities at once. So I have selected the vulnerabilities and now I'm gonna add them to a new job. And this is basically a patch job. So this is a way for me to take all those vulnerabilities and actually remediate them. Now, before I go in and, and show you how this uh, job works, I want to emphasize a few more things. Our agent that is used by patch management is the same agent that are, is used by uh, P, uh, VM and all other, our other models. So it's one agent cross the board that is used for everything Qualys. And in order to use patch management, it's only a matter of enabling the license. You don't need to install anything new on the endpoint. Furthermore, the way patch management works, it only needs the agent, only need inter needs internet connectivity. As long as you can install the agent on the endpoint and it has internet connectivity, you can manage and patch your end, your end users, which means 
working from home, roaming user, on-prem, all the same, very, very easy to deploy. As long as you have the agent, you have internet connectivity, you can easily uh, patch your uh, working from home user or your work users that are working uh, from the office using the same platform without the need to configure VPNs or without the need to uh, build expensive uh, um, or to invest uh, in expensive uh, hardware and software on-prem. So everything is cloud. So once we understand how things work, what do we need? Let's start to look into the uh, patch uh, a job and see how we and learn how we define a job. So here I give a patch a name, and I can give it a description also. Second phase is step is to select what assets I'm gonna I'm gonna patch. So basically my target assets. The best way of doing so is by using tags. Tags is a way to um, uh, a group asset using different attributes. In this case, I have my cloud agent tags that basically represent all my devices that has the agent. The reason I have it here is I want to make sure that all those solar wind related vulnerabilities and fire eye related vulnerabilities are remediated and I want to do it right now. In other cases, you may want to have a tag here that represents a test group because you're first going to deploy to a test group, make sure that the patches are deployed, don't cause any problem, and then you're going to run another job that targets a much more uh, large group of devices. It's very good practice to start with a test group. But for this demo, we're going to select all my assets. Next step is all the patches. Now here, as you can see, what happened is you've this vulnerability that were selected, the, the SolarWind vulnerability that were selected are mapped to the right patches. So this is the list of patches that you need in order to deploy all those vulnerabilities. We did the work for you. We did the research for you. And we were able to map the vulnerability to actually patches. As you can see here, I have patches for different OSs and different architecture. So I have the X64 architecture, and this patch is targeting the server, Windows Server 2012 and uh, Windows 8.1, and this patch targets the Windows 7, okay, and so forth. And there's different patches for different OSs. If you remember, if I go back, if I go to the previous step, I've selected the tag that represents all my assets. These tags, these assets include Windows Servers, Windows 10, Windows 7, all my assets. And here I have all the patches that are targeting different OS, different architecture. What will happen with our platform, with our agent, the agent will be smart enough only to deploy the right patch to the right asset. Meaning only Windows 8.1 uh, uh, devices will get this patch. And only if they're x64 architecture, okay? So if they're not, uh, 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 if they're not to match, we're going to skip this patch. If it's a Windows 10, this patch not go it's not going to be applied. Now, we also, uh, there's no penalties. There are no CPU and memory penalties on those Windows 10 devices. Uh, and we're just going to skip those patches. We're not going to deploy the irrelevant patches. And again, there's no uh, CPU memory uh, impact on those devices. So it's safe to select a, a big portion of your devices. So here I've selected all my cloud, all my agents, and I can select as many patches as I need and we will do the matching, making sure we only deploy the right patch to the right device. So once I have this, all the patches that are required to remediate those uh, FireEye uh, SolarGate uh, vulnerabilities, I'm going to go to the next step, and here I can define when I'm going to deploy this, uh, uh, run this job. So by default, I have my on-demand, meaning I'm going to deploy it right now. This is relevant for mainly desktop, where you just want to start deployment. If it's a server or something like point of sale, so you may want to start deployment at a specific time. So you can set the time. You can also make it a recurrent task. But there's another setting, important setting here, mainly for servers, that provides you a maintenance window or a patch window. Now, what it means, it means that I will only patch during six hours after the start time. Okay, I'm going. if it's not going to be during this, I will not start patching if it's not during this patch window. So it's basically type of a maintenance window, so I can guarantee my machine is only patched during this uh, specific time. Once I set this up, next phase will be, we cancel this. Next phase will be, uh, next phase will be to, uh, to uh, configure the UI. Now, my option here is to show messages to the user before we start the patching, during and after. The patch itself is, is deployed silently, so the user will not notice anything, maybe except of some slowness of the, just because of 
uh, the background task of installing software, but I can set the uh, messages here. More importantly, I can control the reboot. Now, the way Reboot works with our solution is we, we try to minimize Reboot. We understand users don't like to reboot their machine. So what we will do, we will deploy all those patches one by one, and we're gonna look at it, we're gonna learn per each patch is a reboot is needed. So when a patch is deployed, if the OS tells us that a reboot is needed, we only then we're gonna ask for a reboot. If we deploy all those 10 patches and none of them requires a reboot, we're not gonna require a reboot anyhow. But if at least one of them requires a reboot, we're only going to reboot once for this batch of 10 patches. So we're going to deploy the 10. At the end, we're going to ask for reboot once. What you can do here, you can set a message to the user telling the user, in this case, you have three times to defer each time for one hour. So you need to reboot Mr. User, but you can defer three times. Between, you have one hour between each deferral. And then if you do not reboot yourself, we're going to enforce a reboot. We're going to show another message to the user telling the user in one hour, we're going to count down and we're going to reboot it, the machine for you. So you have one hour to reboot. If you have your own reboot uh, uh, mechanism, for example, you have a server and in the server every weekend at 4 a.m. you reboot the servers, you can tell Qualys to suppress reboot, which means Qualys will not enforce any reboot in the endpoint. So that's an optional thing. There's another optional thing which uh, enable uh, opportunistic download, which means we only, we're only we going to try to download the patches before the patch job start. So the patches will be staged. And when the patch job start, the patches will already be on the endpoint and it's just a matter of installing them. Now, one point to understand. The way the agent work with patches, the agent will try to download the patch directly from the vendor, meaning if it's a Microsoft patch, the agent will connect to Microsoft website, download the relevant patch. If it's a Notepad++ patch, we're going to connect to the Notepad++ website and download it from there. Right. So we're taking care of downloading all the patches directly from the vendor. There's no reason to store the patches on prem. However, for servers or other machines that are on prem, if you don't want all those devices to connect directly to the Internet, you can install our gateway on prem. And then when you install the gateway on-prem, the gateway will download the patch once, it will cache the, get, the, the patch um, on the gateway, and all the agent will download the patches directly from, uh, directly from the gateway and not through the internet. So in this case, if you have servers that are uh, located on-premise, those servers will download it from the gateway and will not connect directly to the internet. Now, if you have a, a user, that has a laptop and the laptop is in uh, during the morning, let's say, uh, is on premise at work at the office, then those uh, laptops will connect to the gateway to download the patches from there. But if the user is going home and working from home in the evening, the agent will be smart enough to connect directly to the Internet and download the patch directly from there. So there's the logic inside the agent. So once you configure everything, uh, you can configure job access, meaning the next step will be who owns this job, which user can control the job. And once you provide all the information, you can start, start a job. I'm not going to start a job right now just because it's a production environment. So I'm back to my uh, uh, list of all the vulnerabilities. Now, let me show you how you configure and manage all those jobs. So if I go to my patch management model, which is a standalone model that is designed to manage patch management, it is, it is a complementary uh, model to our vulnerability management, but you can use it as a standalone uh, model to run your patches. So you can see I have a dashboard with all the information about all my patches. And if I go to my patch tab, I can literally see all the patches that are missing in my environment. And you can see we support a very uh, large uh, catalog, meaning we support a lot of third party application. We can patch Firefox and a lot of other uh, third party application. You can see a long list here and on our website. But here is a list of all the patches that are missing in your environment. And you can see this one, the Microsoft Edge or the Plex Media Server is missed on one of my servers. And if I click here, I'll be able to see which ones. By default, the filter shows that, that we are selecting the missing and non superseding in the filter, which means the patches that you see here are patches that are actually missing in your environment and they're not superseding, meaning there's no new patch. And this is the latest one that you need to install. So we don't show you old patches that you actually that actually have been superseded and are not needed in, anymore in your environment. We're only showing you here the patches that you actually need to install. And from here, you can just select the patches that you want. 
and it can be third party patches, Microsoft patches, anything, and then you can create a new job. And it's the same job that I showed you before. So here I have the name, I can select the asset, I will select the test group, and then I have all the patches that I've selected and so forth. So I can create a job that deploy those patches. All those jobs are managed from the jobs tab. So if I go to the jobs tab, I can see all the running jobs and I can go ahead and, and look at the progress of each one of those jobs. So here are all the assets that I have in each one of those jobs and I can see how many uh, patches were installed, how many were failed. If I click on the failed, I will see which patches failed and what is the reason. And you can see here, here I have on the last one, three patches that were skipped, meaning this machine, there were three patches in the job that was that were not relevant to this Windows 10 machine and were basically skipped, either because it's not targeted to the Windows 10 or uh, the patches are not needed, or let's say I want to pa uh, patch Firefox and Firefox is not installed, so it was just skipped. So that just this number, and if I click here, I can see the list of all the patches that were skipped. And with that, I'll conclude my demo and I'll hand it over to Travis, who will show you how you can find compromised devices if they were compromised by the fire by those SolarGate FireEye vulnerabilities. Thank you very much, Aron. So as Aron went over, uh, the important aspect when we talk about these tools and, and the importance of, of what they are to security professionals as we're trying to defend our environments uh, is kind of going back and putting ourselves in the shoes uh, back in December when these, uh, this announcement was made. Uh, you know, back then, you know, Christmas holidays were coming up and uh, you, we were all scrambling trying to figure out, uh, is this my environment? Am I impacted? What do I need to do about it? Um, you know, the first aspect is, you know, make sure that it doesn't happen again, right? As we look at in the patches and making sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, and the second component to follow up on that is, uh, is this in my environment right now, right? The, the answer is, uh, you know, how do I find that answer to, to know uh, what next steps do I have to take? Uh, and an important tool to do that is an endpoint detection and response tool, which is uh, essentially gathering a lot of the telemetry. It's the, the black box recorder that we have that's looking for everything in our environment. Uh, so the, the Qualys EDR platform we have here, um, so what I'm showing is a dashboard that we've uh, created and populated and published to our customers, which uh, highlights a few different critical aspects in relation to uh, not only the, the FireEye tools that we're talking about today, um, but also the kind of the downline impact. What happened from that is, you know, with the uh, Solaris, uh, or sorry, Sol uh, solar winds um, and, you know, Sol uh, solary gate sunburst uh, and those different malwares that came out after the fact. All right, so, you know, from a, a single pane of glass here, we can see uh, essentially a high level overview of um, you know which assets we have you know you're looking for vulnerabilities uh, and what we're uh, essentially collecting uh, telemetry from right you know 70 or so different assets that we have for ER and FIM uh, and which of those have uh, those vulnerabilities uh, specifically uh, that have been highlighted uh, earlier in the webinar today so if I want to answer the question around uh, what is happening in the environment uh, did this uh, did are we impacted and what do we need to do about it um, you know, we have a few different ways to answer that. One is looking for uh, essentially the files or processes that are in that environment. Um, so within this widget here, um, we have all of the, the SHA-256, 75 hashes uh, that you might want to see in relation to these different environments, right? So this is all based off of you know, what we call QQL, which is our Qualys query language, uh, where we're looking for uh, you know, a bunch of those different file hashes, those SHA-256 hashes. Uh, this is something that we keep up to date, uh, or if there is uh, new things that are coming out that you see, uh, very easy for you to pop that in and, and create these different dashboards yourself, right? So we can see of these different file hashes, uh, a couple different hosts uh, within my uh, demo environment here that has those specific hashes on them, right? So if we dig into uh, my host I have here, uh, I can quickly see that there's a couple different uh, data points that we have here. Uh, so there's two different events I have here for this uh, ctoolsexplore.exe. Um, right, so if I highlight over that, I can see that this has been flagged as a malicious file um, from our severity score. We have it as an eight, uh, where it's a file has been written, uh, but not yet executed or, or talking on the network. Uh, we can see some, some quick high-level context around uh, what is going on or how this got on here. So we can see it's written by a executable called curl.exe, uh, and then we can start seeing uh, what's into there. So if I, if I click on one of these, I can see some uh, information on here. Um, but Right now, I'm on my historic view within our uh, our EDR tool, uh, which is kind of our black box recorder uh, of what's uh, everything that's happened on that environment. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to our current view, which is 
uh, what's actively on that device right here, right? So I can start uh, consolidating those events that I had, right? Instead of the, the create and write, now I just have this one event that I can dig into. And you see, I can start getting some actions that I can take on this file here. But let me uh, first understand, is this file bad? Uh, let me uh, under make sure it's not a false positive or you know, things like that. Um, so within the tool here, we can get some context around, you know, get some situational awareness, so to speak, uh, of what this asset is, some hostname information, um, you, know, you know, the last time it checked in, where it's located in the world. Um, you know, I can dig into this and, and go into our asset inventory tool and, and see, uh, you know, some more information about that asset if I, if I really wanted to. But right now, I'm more, mostly concerned about uh, this specific event that I have here, this explorer.exe, which uh, just by looking at the file name could be um, benign or not, right? We know Explorer is in, on Windows uh, quite often, uh, but we do know attackers are, uh, you know, leveraging uh, legitimate file names trying to masquerade within the environment, All right? So let's, let's see what's going on here. So um, our intelligence that we're providing within this tool is telling us that this family name uh, and category, so it's a, a Win32 exploit because it's on Windows, um, you know, exploit CVE uh, 2016-0167, right? That's one of the ones that Anand had went and discussed earlier uh, in the webinar today, right? And again, I said, you know, this is a, a score of eight, which is a malicious file. Um, so it's a file uh, not yet executed um, so that we don't have evidence of this executing an environment yet, which is good. Uh, so that, that helps uh, at least ease my suspicions when I'm doing the, the incident response to this specific event. And I can scroll down and see some uh, other information about this file, right? So this is uh, file was written to disk. Um, here's the explorer name, and these are these are uh, hyperlinked. Uh, so I can then, um, as I'm going further in the investigation, right, I can see uh, was there uh, another uh, uh, C tools file, you know, explorer.exe written uh, not just on this asset, but any number of my assets in my environment, right? So in case um, you know we, we want to see some of these other uh, TTPs across the environment, we can start hunting for those as well. Uh, same for these file hashes, we can click into those. Uh, but important thing here is right. We can then you know search for this hash directly on Google or look it up on Virus Total. Uh, so if I dig into Virus Total, we can confirm that yes, this is an actual uh, piece of malware. You know, 41 of the 71 engines that Virus Total uh, knows or leverages within their environment are flagging it. Uh, I mean, you see, you know, some of these other you know popular um, AV or EDR tools down here are not uh, detecting this specific file. Um, so it gives you some further confirmation around uh, is this bad or is this malicious uh, or not. All right, so um, again, getting more information about the file, just trying to confirm my suspicions as I go through, um, you know, some of the file properties, right? If you right clicked on a file and saw what that was, you can see, uh, you know, how big the file is. Last time it was, you know, created, modified, uh, delete, or accessed. Uh, if it is an actual, it has some of this other metadata in it for, you know, product and company, we'll show that there. Um, as well as the, um, the parent process. So what file created this? Like, again, I said, uh, you know, this curl.exe, uh, uh, was uh, in there as well. Um, so we can see this is a Windows System 32 uh, binary. So it was a, you know, potentially a legitimate binary, a curl.exe binary in the environment uh, that's in there. So uh, again, we can click into that uh, and see uh, some more information. Maybe did, uh, did this create other events? Did this create other files? Did it uh, do other uh, suspicious things? And again, we can see the arguments here. Uh, you know, for the specific uh, demo environment here is downloaded directly from uh, virus total, right? As we want to, you know, populate this environment with some things. Uh, but looking at things like arguments, uh, parent process, uh, those types of things, uh, that gives us further context and, and awareness around what's going on, uh, confirming that it is malicious, right? And then if it was a process, we can, you know, dig into the process tree and see, you know, the, the parent process and kind of visualize that a little bit more, right? But uh, I'm fairly certain that this is a piece of malware in my environment. So I want to take, you know, take an action and get rid of it. Right. And I can either in the beginning of my uh, investigation, I could have gone through and quarantine the file or we go through and, you know, encrypt that file and, and make sure that it can't be used and, you know, re-leveraged and, um, uh, by the adversary, if you do have a, uh, a human adversary behind this, uh, this file, right. We'll, we'll prevent them from doing that. Uh, but we can also do other things like, uh, delete the file, right. If this was a, a running process and we see the evidence of execution, we can uh, kill that process. But again, uh, this is just a file, so we can just go ahead, uh, and I want to go ahead and delete this file. So I'm going to just tell it that, um, you know, let's delete this file, um, you know, explore.exe on, you know, Travis ATW10 on my device. Um, I'll just say I'm going to, you know, kill this malware, uh, and I can execute the action. So then this will then uh, send that request back down to the file, uh, sorry, back down to the agent and delete that file from the endpoint uh, and clear it up. All right, so we've taken that action. Uh, so very quickly, uh, within a few steps of just digging, looking at a dashboard and digging into the events that we're seeing there, 
uh, we can you know understand you know if we have an event or not in our environment that we need to take a look at and if we do uh, very quickly within a couple of clicks uh, take action and remediate any number of assets within our environment so then once we have this we want to then understand uh, is this elsewhere in our environment and that helps you know, you can click through and, and do these QQLs here uh, or then understand uh, I, I want to make sure that this isn't going to happen again in the future and if it does to make sure that I get notified about that um, so you know, making sure it doesn't happen again that goes back to Iran and what he was talking about with you know finding those vulnerabilities and applying those patches uh, for what we understand is associated with this specific attack vector um, but if there were ways that they were to get around maybe they're going to leverage a new um, a new vulnerability to, to drop these same tools in, uh, we can go through and make sure that we um, provide responses around that. And again, you know, saw here, we deleted that file so it's no longer in the current, it's not currently on the asset, so it's no longer in that current view. Um, so if I want to get alerted about any of these things uh, again in the future, um, I want to then, you know, create a, a you know, a rule uh, around what this is doing. So I went through and populated some of this before. Um, so I have uh, those file hashes that are associated with that machine. I'm sorry, with that, uh, that, that uh, specific CVE. Uh, so these are the, the file hashes that Anand had talked about uh, earlier in his uh, presentation. Um, so if any um, one of these, again, you know, that QQL, so I mean, this is essentially the same QQL that we saw uh, from the dashboard, uh, if any of these events comes in and it matches that, I can take an action on it. Uh, so for example, in here, uh, I'm saying I want it to then uh, send an email to myself uh, if any of these comes uh, in in the future. So I don't have to rely on going in and looking at a dashboard and um, you know trying to, to do manual efforts, right? So as much as we can automate this process, uh, the much better it's going to be uh, in the environment. All right, so, uh, again, it all comes down to having the insight, having that context, and going through and finding those uh, events that you have within your environment. Uh, so then I'll uh, go ahead and uh, switch over now, and we can uh, begin taking any questions that you guys might have uh, from today's presentation. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. Before we get to the questions, um, a word about the slides. The slides are available for download at the bottom of the screen. If you're having issues with the download, please right click to open a new tab and continue with your download. We hope that that will fix it for you. And now the first question. Does a, And this question is for Travis. Does a single agent handle asset discovery, EDR, and patch management? Hello, we're, I'm sorry, we're having just a little bit of technical difficulty with the Q&A. So Tammy, this is Aran, I can take this uh, question. So Thank you. The answer is yes, we, we use the same agent, the same uh, agent across the board. So once you install the agent once, it will uh, can be used for EDR, patch, vulnerability management, everything is the same agent, nothing more to install. Great, thank you. And Aran, the next question is for you. How do we get access to the patch management feature from within Qualys? So it's basically, as I said, that if you already have the agent, the, you already have patch management, it's only an enabling the license. So you just need to ask for a trial license if you want to test this uh, patch management. But once you have the, the license, it's just their part of the console. Great, thank you. Um, now we're going to go back to Travis if his microphone is working. Does, qualify, does Qualys identify device vulnerability to malware associated with the solar wind breach known as supernova? Hey, Tammy, this is Mehul. I can take this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. So we do have coverage for uh, for the supernova malware. It's QID 11515, and it can detect it. 
Awesome. Thank you. It seems as though Travis is having some issues. So we will continue on with another question for Iran. Um, does the 60 day free trial come with features like VMDR patch management and EDR? What are the limitations, if any? So there's no limitations. Once you start to try the 60 day trials, you get access to all our features. Again, you just need to install the agent. As long as you have internet connectivity, you just can start working with all our feature set. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is also for you, Iran. Um, do we receive notifications after each successful or unsuccessful scheduled patch job? So there's no email that is sent. It's a feature that we will be working on, but it's really easy to go to the jobs tab and just uh, keep track of uh, the status of each job and see the progress from there. Thank you. Okay, the next question is for Anand. Um, regarding the presentation, these are vulnerabilities used in the recent FireEye attack. Even the Outlook attached from 2017? Uh, no, these vulnerabilities um, are not act were not actually used to breach into the FireEye, but these are the vulnerabilities uh, that were being used by uh, Red Team tools devised by FireEye that got um, um, leaked essentially as part of the breach. Great, thank you. Um, next question is for Aran. Do you only patch Microsoft products or also um, apps from different vendors? Did we, did we now lose Iran? We are sorry for these technical difficulties. Oh, now you should hear me. Now you should yes, hear me. Yes, we do. Sorry, so I, I was saying that the large, uh, so our product supports a large catalog of a third party application as well as everything Microsoft. So to answer your question, no, we don't only focus on Microsoft. We have support for a very large uh, Mike, uh, uh, Apple, Google, Chrome, Firefox, uh, Adobe, a lot of those applications also. Um, Great, and we and we we also um, the next question is also for you, Iran. What types of users have access to patch management? Can does anyone have access? Is it only managers? Please elaborate. So, as as long as the as you have a license, you can access. But we provide the uh, um, so you can set the access as as part of uh, you know when you assign licenses, but. You can also set role-based access inside patch management, so you can create different roles. So you may create a role that says, I have my security pers a person that only runs the scan, but he can actually not deploy the patches. And you can have another person that can access the patch management and deploy those patches. So you have a lot of granularity there. Great, thank you. There, there's actually a follow-up question on the patching. How long would it take to apply the patches? What's the minimum and maximum time? So th that's... It's quite, uh, uh, there's a long answer here, but it really de depends on how you deploy those jobs. The actual deployment of the patch is like deploying any, that, like you're doing it manually, installing the, the software on the endpoint, but you can schedule those jobs or you can set them to start right now. So it may take some time until the job reaches the endpoint and the endpoint starts to patch, but it really depends on your settings. So minimum can be, few, uh, you know, 10, 20 minutes maximum can be a much longer depending on your setting. Okay. Um, next question is for Anand. It says you presented the details for five of the 16 CVEs. Um, are the same details available for the remaining nine CVEs? Uh we do have those details, but we haven't published them yet. Um, we are planning on doing a, a follow-up series for uh, providing more uh, context around the remaining CVEs. We have selected these um, since they are most prevalent across the footprint of the vulnerabilities we have seen. So that's why we have emphasized on these for now. Great. Um, and the next question, what are the limitations on the Mac OS platform? So if you ask this question with regards to patch management, then so the, the, the agent runs on Mac like any other uh, OSs, but 
From a patching specifically perspective, we don't support Mac yet. This is something we're working on. Um, I think that, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're about to close out, but before we do, um, I wanted to let everybody know that if you go to qualis.com and to our blog, you'll find a write-up um, uh, with more details. And also, if you're interested in signing up for the free trial, please click on the link that is showing on your screen. We want to thank everyone for joining, and we appreciate all of your questions. Have a lovely day. Thank you.